Welcome to this video on the Somata sensory homunculus. I've been fascinated by the Somata sensory homunculus ever since it was introduced to me in a neurology lecture, a little human inside our brains. It's been depicted in different ways, turned into a weird ornament, and remains popular in textbooks and teaching to this day. This is an example of the homunculus ornament, and this is an example of a typical scientific image of the somatosensory homunculus. And this is the original image from 1937. So what is it? How was it created? And is it correct? Let's start with what it is. Homunculus means little person, and its origins date back to 16th century alchemy, a type of philosophy blended with pseudoscience, which suggested such things as you can take a male sperm, put it in a pumpkin, and then put it in a horse, feed it some human blood, and you'll create a very small human. That's the homunculus. If these historical origins interest you, I'll leave you to discover more weird science in your own time. As for now, I'm going to steer the conversation back towards mainstream science. So from the 16th century, we'll step forward to 1937, and here we can meet the Somata sensory homunculus, a creation of Wilder Penfield and Edwin Baldry. Its origins are fascinating, especially when you consider the fact that the 80 plus year old Somata sensory homunculus is perhaps the most reproduced image in neuroscience. This little creature still captures our imagination and forms the backdrop to more recent neurological concepts, such as smudging and cortical plasticity. Next, let's discuss how it was created. Wilder Penfield, a progressive neurosurgeon, used the data from electrical brain stimulations of 126 live and awake patients who were receiving only local anesthesia and so could be relied upon to participate by giving verbal recognition of sensation and elicited movements. Now, patient consent for the study was fortunately not needed because the patients were being treated for severe epilepsy and to determine the correct brain areas to destroy, Penfield first assessed the related sensory and motor functions using electrical stimulation paired with the patient's verbal or movement feedback. To those of us unfamiliar with brain surgery, it's a haunting scene. Skull removed, brain exposed, patient awake and limbs moving. But is the somatosensory homunculus a correct representation? How they use the brain stimulation to create the homunculus image is important for us to understand. Essentially, it involved a large leap of statistical faith and artistic interpretation by Edwin Baldry. This could have led to the significant augmentation or significant reduction of the final body part sizes. Now, throughout its life, some academics have considered the homunculus a gross oversimplification and even a misrepresentation. Before we make our judgment, this is how it was created. The somatosensory homunculus was generated from 170 stimulation point maps, indicating the number and location of the stimulation points for each body part. These were then color coded. Have a look at the images shown here. Here, the points are plotted in enclosed body region outlines. And on this one here, they're shown in a vertical length distribution. And in this one, simply by location. Interestingly, they were unable to measure the area and length of the trunk, and therefore the data for this region was absent. They also struggled to find the nose, and unusually the eye movement stimulation points were outside of the face representation. Other studies have shown that the movement of the same body part can be elicited by stimulations far apart from other body parts in between the two stimulation points. This significantly challenges the more defined topography of the sensorimotor homunculus. The central sulcus was also shown to not be a clear boundary between motor and sensory areas. The original data already showed significant overlap in the stimulation fields with undefined body part boundaries, something which the ensuing homunculus actually failed to represent. Reanalysis of the original data highlighted functional maps that were not included in the original conclusion. They would have made the homunculus far too complex as an image. These functional overlaps or co-stimulations include bundles such as arm and hand or even mouth arm and hand with a high degree of overlap around the central sulcus, indicating the integrated nature of sensory and motor cortical relationships and indicative of the goal-orientated function rather than regional function. 
We can look here at tractography for a more modern analysis of the cortex. Tractograms use diffusion MRI data to produce a 3D model that visually represents nerve tracts. Catani and colleagues in 2012 identified connections or association tracks that demonstrate communication through U-shaped fibres between the motor and sensory homunculi across the central sulcus. So in conclusion, Penfield and Baldry's homunculus had challenges from its beginnings and its passage through time has always been challenged by scientists. Although many of its specific features are now disproven, this little person inside our head remains a popular and arresting image. Perhaps one reason it's weathered so well is the fact that it boldly serves as a visual metaphor of how our brain might engage with stimuli and movement. And when it comes to neuroscience, there are no other images that offer such simplicity from complexity.